Good morning. I want to invite you right where you are to begin to share in a journey from despair to hope. I know, and you're also very aware, that we're living in a time when a lot of people are experiencing different levels of despair. Some experiencing loneliness or grief, people experiencing depression, marital difficulties because of the intensity of time together, or issues relating to parenting, economic difficulties, finances, problems with unemployment, People experiencing grief and sometimes not even able to be there with their loved ones. All of the uncertainty that's a part of this time of despair in our lives. But I want you to join a journey of moving from despair to hope today. As we begin to look at that, as we think about the challenges you're facing as we consider the people that you care about. How can we take that journey from despair to hope? There's a story in the Bible I found in Luke chapter 24. That's a part of the Easter story, but it's really something that happens towards the end of that day. Only Luke records this. It's not found in Matthew or Mark or John. Uh, Luke is a doctor, and he writes the Gospel of Luke in the book of Acts. And in both of those, he uses a journey motif as a part of the whole literary devices of the books. Jesus constantly moving uh, to Jerusalem to the cross and ultimately to the empty tomb. And in the book of Acts, he's, he's got this journey from Jerusalem to the ends of the earth. It, it's fascinating to me that in Luke 24, we have a journey motif. We have this journey from despair to hope. And we read about it, um, and, and there's in Luke chapter 24, beginning at verse 19, verse 13, that very day two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. So if you look at the map that is here, you'll be able to see that actual uh, location. It's a, a north and west of, of, of Jerusalem, about seven miles, it's the little town of Emmaus. And and the journey itself didn't take that long, but it was a very significant journey because not only were they taking the steps and those movements, but in stages, they were going to move from despair to hope. Perhaps you've taken trips as a family. I know we have. And sometimes if it's a longer trip, a vacation, we'll actually plan stages in that journey about how far we're going to go each day and where we're going to stay. I have a group of guys from our church where I do motorcycle trips with uh, every summer, and, and we plan out these long trips, and how much do we think we can travel in a day, and where are we going to stay? You know, in moving from despair to hope, there's also some stages, a process that needs to happen, and, and how that needs to take place. In Luke chapter 24, we, we read that they were talking with each other in verse 14 about the things that had happened. And as that happens, these people were experiencing, these two people, these two disciples, only one is named Cleopas a little bit later. We don't know the name of the other one, but we know they were followers of Jesus. And we know from the narrative, from the story, that they were experiencing a lot of angst, a lot of despair. Maybe you are facing. What was their cause of despair? The death of Jesus, who had been their hope. His extreme suffering and the horror of that. The confusion about how could God let that happen? You may be asking, how can God let happen what's happening in our world right now? And they were struggling with that question. They were experiencing despair about the future, the uncertainty that they were facing. Many of the same things that you and I are experiencing today. But Jesus came and walked this journey with them. In Luke 24, beginning at verse 15, while they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. Friend, I want to just say to you that Jesus wants to draw near to you in your despair. And he's willing to do that, and he's able to do that because he's risen from the dead. And he's able to enter into your experience. Do you know there's a direct link in the the reality of of our moving from despair to hope as we invite Jesus to share that journey with us. Jesus was going to lead them on the journey. He was going to walk with, with them, and he wants to walk with you through that same journey. My friend, Jesus is here. 
He is present and he is the source of our hope. His resurrection is the reason that we can have hope. It makes a difference. Peter later would write in 1 Peter 1.3 that, that we have a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. We have a hope that's alive, that can help us face the despair, the difficulties that we're facing. Paul would later write even with grieving Christians about those who had lost loved ones in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and he would tie it to the gospel and say, because Jesus died and rose again, we have a reason for hope. And the author of Hebrews describes our hope as an anchor for the soul, that in the midst of the storms, in the midst of the difficulty, we have an anchor because Jesus Christ not only rose from the dead, but ascended to heaven and there makes intercession for us. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the foundational basis of us having a reason to hope, to be able to move in this journey from despair to hope. So how can you, how can I, Walk with Jesus this journey. What are the stages? What are the steps that we can take? The first thing I want to say to you is whatever you're facing, whatever the difficulty is that's overwhelming your soul, whatever the despair is in your heart, tell it to Jesus in prayer. Tell it to Jesus. Fascinates me as Jesus came alongside them and began to draw near and walk with them. In verse 16, we read, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And we're going to talk about that right now, but later we're going to unfold that about why. And he said to them, what is this conversation that you're holding with one another as you walk? And they stood still looking sad, depressed. They were confused. Their faces showed it. They were sad. They were experiencing despair. One of them, named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have happened these days? And he says to them, What things? Pause this for a moment here. Jesus begins to engage with them by asking questions. And God never asks a question because he lacks information. He asks a question to draw us out so that we will talk to him, so we'll open our hearts and souls to him. And Jesus does that here. He asks several questions. Interesting that they said, are you a stranger in Jerusalem? Do you not know what's happened here? They don't know who they're talking to. And Jesus says, what things? And they said, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty indeed, his miracles, and in word, his teachings before God and all the people. And how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he would be the one that redeemed Israel. We, we had hope means in the past we had hope, but now we don't have hope. We're experiencing this despair. We're experiencing this sense of hopelessness. Yes, and besides all this, now the third day since these things have happened, and moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They, I went to the tomb early in the morning, and when they didn't find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. And some of those who were with us, went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but him they did not see. So beyond all this, now we have an empty tomb. We don't know about the body of Jesus, and they weren't yet convinced of his resurrection. And in all of this, Jesus is inviting them to talk to him. And Jesus is inviting you. Tell it to Jesus in prayer, friend, because he still listens. He gathered with them, he asked questions, and he listened. And as you pray, he's ready to listen to your heart. Prayer is a relational communication with God. It's heart talk to God. And in the midst of our anxiety, in the midst of all of the stress inside, Paul wrote this, Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your heart and your mind through Christ Jesus. Tell it to Jesus in prayer. He still listens. The author of Hebrews tells us that when we pray, we're coming to God's throne of grace where we can obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Hebrews 4, 15 to 16. 
Friend, listen, when you pray, Jesus is ready to listen to you. Tell it to him. Tell it to him. Prayer is not for emergency use only. It's for right now. And you can bring your concerns. You can bring your emotions. You can bring your thoughts. You can bring the confusion. You can bring it all to him in prayer. And that's where it starts. It's where we start the journey from despair to hope. So whatever is on your heart, whatever you're concerned about it, tell it to him. The journey doesn't stop there, though. Here's the second thing that happens. Listen to Jesus in the Bible because he still speaks. Tell it to Jesus in prayer. He still listens. Listen to Jesus in the Bible because he still speaks. So after Jesus had this time of listening and asking questions, he said to them, O foolish ones, slow of heart to believe all that the prophets had spoken. Was it not necessary that Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. Jesus wants you to listen to him. He wants you to, to hear him in the Bible because Jesus still speaks. So he begins to interact with them and challenge them about all of the things that were written in the 39 books of the Old Testament about him. In the prophets, in the books of Moses, in the Psalms, in all of the prophets, all of the promises, all of the prophecies about Jesus Christ, particularly about his suffering, his death. Uh, passages like Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53 that detail what that was going to be like, but also about his glory, about his resurrection and all that would happen. And all of the pictures of Jesus, like Isaac being offered in Genesis, like, the, like all of these sacrifices in Leviticus, all of these promises, all of these pictures, all of these prophecies of Christ, he's unfolding to them and reminding them. Friends, you can have a personal encounter with Jesus Christ through the Bible. And maybe it's not part of your daily life to read, or study, and to dig into God's word. I want to encourage you, there's never been a time better than right now. Take your Bible, whether it's on your cell phone or a paper copy, and begin to read. You say, I don't know where to start. Well, friends, Pastor Joel is in a series right now in the Gospel of John. You can dig in because John, one of the closest friends of Jesus, had such a personal encounter with him. And on every page, you can learn who Jesus is and what it is to have a relationship with him. You can go to the Psalms, and you find that the psalmist shared all of the angst of his life, all of the things that he was struggling with, with God, and encountered God there in prayer and in truth and was changed. So listen to Jesus in the Bible. You can go into the book of Philippians, very short letter from Paul, only four chapters. He's under house arrest when he writes it, and yet such encouragement and hope for a time like this. Friends, listen to Jesus in the Bible. One of the things that happens in despair is our thoughts get all tangled up and we get all distracted and, and twisted and torn apart inside. But when we listen to Jesus in the Bible, we're able to begin to think differently and gain God's perspective and gain faith and gain God's wisdom. So talk to Jesus in prayer. He still listens. Listen to Jesus in the Bible because he still speaks. The next thing that happened is fascinating to me because in verse 28, they drew near to the village to which they were going, and he acted as if he was going to go further. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it's toward evening, and the day is now far spent. In other words, it's getting dark. And he went in to stay with them. He accepted their invitation. And when he is with table with them, he took the bread and blessed them and broke it and gave it to them. So here's the third thing. Invite Jesus into your home. Jesus acted as if he was going to keep on walking. And these two disciples said, no, come, come and stay with us. Come and be in our home. He invited them into their home. And Jesus came in and, and the guest became the host. He took the bread and he broke it. And, and then they began to recognize him. I want to encourage you to invite Jesus into your home. You say, well, how do I do that? 
If you live alone, I want to encourage you in that time of personal worship, in that time in prayer, in that time in the word, invite Jesus into your home. But I want to also encourage you to be able to engage with others, to pick up your phone and call somebody, to be able to engage with others through a FaceTime, through uh, some kind of a video chat, to be able to involve others and to invite Jesus into your home. If you're married, by praying together and, and sharing conversations, by doing what you're doing right now, by worshiping together, if you have children, invite Jesus into your home by taking the resources that we have for children to teach them. Our, our kids' ministry has done a marvelous job of being able to make those things available to you. Right now, media tools are opportunities for you as a family to learn and grow and share together. Invite Jesus into your home because, listen, when you do, he accepts the invitation. In the book of Revelation, chapter 3 and verse 20, Jesus, writing to a church, uh, said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anybody hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and I will dine with him. In other words, we will fellowship together. And for some of you right now, you've kind of locked Jesus out of your schedule, you've locked him out of your home, and it's time, it's time today to say our family's gonna be different, our home's gonna be different. We're gonna take this time to retool our family to center on a relationship with Jesus Christ. And when you do that, your home moves from despair to hope. Taking time just to pray together briefly, taking time to share the Bible together, taking time to learn together, moving from despair to hope by inviting Jesus into your home. Here's a fourth thing that you can do in this journey from despair to hope, and that is you can learn what it means to walk with Jesus by faith. In verse 31, we read that their eyes were opened and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. If you look back at verse 16, their eyes were kept from recognizing him. In other words, they were supernaturally prevented from recognizing who Jesus was. And now at the end of this time when he has been invited into their home and shared a meal with them, their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And then he vanished, moved himself from their sight. And they turned to one another and said, did not our hearts burn within us that passion? Well, he talked to us along the way and well, he opened to us the scriptures. Walk with Jesus by faith. It's very interesting to me that only in this narrative do we read that people were prevented supernaturally from seeing and recognizing who Jesus was. When the disciples saw him, they acknowledged him. He looked the same in his resurrected body. They could see the nail prints in his hands. They could see the spear wound in his side. And they, they recognized who he was by his features, by his face, by his person. But on this occasion, the Emmaus disciples were supernaturally prevented from recognizing him. And at the end of this passage, they begin to recognize him and he disappears. I got curious about that and began thinking, why? I mean, these disciples were in despair. If Jesus had just allowed them to recognize his face and knew who he, his identity, wouldn't it have given them hope? Wouldn't it have answered their questions and helped them? Why in this entire time when he's listening to them and asking questions and sharing with them scripture and, and actually dining in their home, why would it be that he would prevent them from recognizing? And then a thought occurred to me. Jesus had been with his disciples for three and a half years. And he was going to not only be resurrected, but he was going to ascend to heaven not long after that. And his followers would no longer have the benefit of his physical presence. They had seen him with their eyes. They had heard him with their ears. They had engaged with him. They could reach out and touch him. But that was going to end. And it was going to be a faith relationship that prayer and the word of God were going to be a part of that. Friends, maybe you wish that God would somehow just show up physically and visibly to you. I want to say he's already taken initiative to reveal himself. 
He's done that in creation. The heavens declare the glory of God. He's done that in scripture and he's done that in the person of Jesus Christ. But our relationship with him is a walk by faith. It is a faith journey. Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 actually says it so clearly. We walk by faith, not by sight. Hebrews chapter 11, the great faith chapter in the Bible tells us that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Thomas, one of Jesus' disciples, wasn't there the first time he shows up in the upper room. And the other disciples talked about their encounter with the risen Christ. And his response was, uh, Thomas said, unless I see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails, Unless I see in his side the spear wound and put my hand in there, I will not believe. A week later, Jesus shows up in the upper room and Thomas is there. Jesus says to Thomas, personally and individually, Thomas, reach your finger in and touch the nail print. Reach your hand in and feel the spear wound. And Thomas doesn't do that. He says, my Lord and my God. And Jesus makes this profound statement. Thomas, because you have seen, you believe. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Friends, that's you and that's me. Our walk is a walk of faith. But you can walk by faith because he is still faithful. Our risen Christ still lives, wants to walk with you in this journey from despair to hope, but he's asking you to trust him based on the revelation he's given in the Bible, the reality of who he is, because he is still faithful. He can be trusted. These are times like many of us have never experienced, but Jesus is still faithful. He hasn't changed. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever, and by faith we can trust him. The last thing that happens here is we need to learn to share Jesus with others. Because as soon as they had this experience, they rose in the same hour and they returned to Jerusalem. They went the seven miles back and it's probably after dark. They found the 11 disciples and those that were gathered together with them. And they made the statement, the Lord has risen indeed and he's appeared to Peter. And he told what had happened on the road and how it was known to them in the breaking of the bread. Later, Jesus actually shows up there and he speaks to the disciples and says, peace be unto you. And to prove his resurrection body, he asked them to provide a meal and he actually partook of the food, proving that his body was truly risen. He was not just a ghost. So share Jesus with others. Why? Because he still shows up. He still shows up. Friends, Jesus shows up as as they gather together in community with one another. We need to gather together in community with one another. One of the things that we're we're developing here is called connection groups. It's a form of small groups that was shared earlier that will only meet for six times because we know it's just an entry point, entry point for you, a chance to get to know one another's story, to pray together, to share together sermon-based discussion questions. But we need to gather together with other followers of Christ to be able to be encouraged. We're doing that online through Zoom and other platforms. You can sign up for that. We need others. We need to encounter others. And interesting here that the disciples said, he's appeared to Peter We know nothing about that encounter. It's mentioned also by Paul in 1 Corinthians 15. But we know this, that Peter had denied Jesus. And now we need to share Jesus with others who need to be restored. Who in that despair need to find fresh hope. And Peter encountered the risen Christ in a way that restored his soul. But also as we reach out to neighbors and we reach out to others, because Jesus Christ still transforms lives today. And it may be that you have never come to trust in Jesus as your personal Savior, to know that he died on the cross as a substitute for your sin, that you could be forgiven, that you could be cleansed, that you could have a whole new life with him. So friends, listen, you are invited to a journey You are invited to travel this path, to take these steps of moving from despair to hope. You can do that by telling it to Jesus in prayer. That may be right now. 
you taking time to say, just pour it out, tell him. By actually listening to Jesus in the Bible and saying, I'm going to take my Bible, I'm going to read it, I'm going to take some of those books we talked about, and I'm going to dig in and let God speak to me, because he still speaks today. Uh, for us, it's inviting Jesus into our home to say, we're going we're gonna to make our family different. We're going to center our marriage on Jesus Christ. We're going to center our family around a relationship with God. And even if you live alone, I'm going to invite others to encounter Jesus with me, and I'm going to put Jesus in the center of everything in our home. I'm going to walk this walk by faith even when I don't understand, because I know that he's faithful and can still be trusted. And I'm going to share Jesus with others. I'm not gonna try this journey alone. I'm gonna do it with him. And so friends, I invite you. I invite you to the journey. Move from despair to hope. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you that everything that we have shared in worship and the word is true. Thank you, risen Christ, that you still desire to walk with us in this journey. That, that you want to be able to reach into the hearts and homes and lives of people that are struggling with despair. And you want to bring hope. Holy Spirit, thank you that your presence makes such a difference as the comforter, as the helper. And so we invite you into our lives, we invite you into our homes, we invite you into our schedules and say, Lord, help us. Not to try to get the answers for what we're struggling with from the news, but from the good news that Jesus Christ has died on the cross and risen again. May we, Lord, find these steps in prayer, in your word, and in welcoming you into our homes, and living by faith and experiencing community with others that we too today can walk with a risen Christ. So Father, for those with needs, for those that are struggles, meet them at the point of their need and transform lives for your glory and for our good. In Jesus' mighty name we pray, amen.